Genesis chapter 13. <clears throat> Hear the word of God to us this morning. So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and in gold, and he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at the first, and there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. And Lot, who went with Abram, also with flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I'll go to the right. If you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, in the direction of Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward, eastward and westward, for all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which, is, which are at Hebron, and there he built an altar to the Lord. Father, what a, um, what a journey Abram's already had. And Father, I pray that as we see in his life pictures and types of the Lord Jesus Christ, that even if they're not mentioned from the pulpit this morning, that we might see elements of, of that truth or the Old Testament concealed, reveals in the New Testament the truth. And Lord, we see elements throughout the Old Testament of Christ-likeness, Jesus-likeness, and the, the, the men and who were journeying and learning and growing and being challenged by the things of this world their faith their joy their their possessions their lives so father we want to learn today from your word what you have for us that we would take these thousands of years ago truths and move them into our realm of being and father if there's going to be any learning today if there's going to be an encouragement any correction any challenge it's going to be because the holy spirit of god is among us to tap us on our heart, to open our mind, to understand, our eyes to see. So, Father, I am weak. Use this vessel, please, in some way to glorify your name and to further your kingdom in our lives. I would ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Well, we began chapter 13 with yet another so which we talked about two weeks ago now. Simply put, this one was a, a so that responded to the call of Pharaoh to leave Egypt for um, Abram and his family and Lot to leave. It was a dem demand, really, of Pharaoh to go. He had been fed up, perhaps, and so he leaves, and so he goes, leaving behind that which was in Egypt, moving toward the Promised Land yet again, toward the Negev. Obviously, the famine has been removed or ceased in the land of Canaan and the Lord saw to it gracefully and by his glory that Abram didn't spend too long down in Egypt. We know what it's like when, when we are comfortable in a place. We don't want to leave. And so the Lord did not allow him to stay there so, so complacently that he would not want to leave Egypt. But through Pharaoh's encouragement, he and Lot and the families and the possessions all left Egypt moving back toward the Canaan land. It was a place of provision for Abram. We saw that last week as well, that God had provided for him greatly. And when I read this account, I'm reminded of, of the Lord's 
um, story, event of the prodigal son. Um, he had everything, and he left it to go serve and to be in a different country to, to live out his sinful heart. And one day he awakened and saw how terrible his conditions were. And what did he want to do? He wanted to go back to the land where his father was, where he had so much, where he was so provided for. And that's such a powerful story. And I think we can see some similarities here between Abram as he leaves Egypt, going back toward the promised land. And we can see it in our own lives, some of the choices that we make from time to time, the things that have held us captive, our own Egypt, as it were, and how God has been so gracious to bring us out of that, to force us, to, to change our heart or whatever it would be to move us from that Egypt experience back to what we know is to be true in God's word. Well, the Lord's sovereign hand moved Abram from Egypt at the right time. He took them out of that place. And I wonder for you and I this morning, what best describes your life where you are? And let's not take it for granted just because you've been in church most of your life, because you know scripture is hidden on your heart. Let's not take it for granted. Are you more likely living in a world and it's plenty kind of unsatisfied because you know there's more this is not where the Lord wants you to be and you're struggling with that from time to time or are you in Christ and you know that and you're kept and you're provided for and you're filled with an eternal hope that can only come from the Lord Jesus Christ you know you can be a Christian and still live in Egypt sometime I'm not saying Abraham was not a was not a believer he was but Tom had him God had him spend some time in Egypt and sometimes you and I go there of our own will, of our own desires and choices. And some I think God moves us there so we can appreciate the things of the word of God. I like what Kent Hughes stated with what I believe to be so awfully, often true for ourselves as well, an accurate picture of where we might be. The record of Abram's fiasco in Egypt is the story of a man of faith. His scandalous attempt to represent Sarai as his sister was not the act of a man devoid of real faith but of a man who had succumbed to doubt, whose trust had devolved to distrust. His trust had devolved to distrust. And I'm concerned this morning that for you and I, sometimes it speaks about us. We profess the Lord Jesus Christ on one moment and in one side of our mouth, and at the other time we're really longing for Egypt. Our experiences in Egypt can be used by God to show us how far we are from true worship of God and you know this for, your fa for a fact for your own life. When you come into church in, on Sunday morning and you're not enth enthralled with worship and it's not your heart to be poured out and worship and honor God through music, through prayer, through Bible reading, through the sermon, through communion, then there's something amiss. But when you come in here to this place excited and longing, regardless if there's 10 of us or 500 of us, to meet with God and to truly worship him, to long to be in his presence, to long to be in Canaan, the provision of the Lord. It's an amazing experience, and I trust that you and I will spend more time doing that than having our eyes truly in Egypt while we're here in this world physically, in this place. We must never forget that as Christians, God still at work. He's still at work in you and I even when we spend our time in Egypt. He's not a God that says, well, there he goes again. He's off in Egypt, so forget him. No, he's there with us. When we make those choices to go and, and do things that we shouldn't or go places we shouldn't or have a mindset that we shouldn't have, our Egypt experience, God is still with us. And he's using that time, I believe, in many more ways than we can experience with a, with a moment of telling about it. He's still working to bring about what is good for you and what is good for me and bringing him the glory that is due his name. Well, it would appear that uh, Egypt, as you would remember, as we would see later on, is that Joseph was a place, was, it was a place that Joseph was sent as well. Abram's great-grandson, Joseph. He would be sold into slavery into Egypt. We know that story. We don't have to go back there again, but we see the hand of God moving in every aspect of that. Yet again, at every aspect, we say, wait a minute, what is going on here? But as it unfolds and continues to unfold, we see how God moved to provide for, for Joseph's family in Egypt, in a foreign land, so God remained faithful with Joseph, he remained faithful with Abram, and he will remain faithful with you and myself when we are in times of unfaithfulness. 
or unrighteousness in our own lives, our own Egypt experience. Remember that. Not sure how long Abram was in Egypt, but it was sufficient enough time for him to gain much possessions. Verse 2 reminds us, it says, now, 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 Abram was very rich in livestock in silver and in gold, very rich. Not just status quo rich, not just um, everyday rich. He was very rich in these things, these possessions. There was no indication that he had brought this with him and so it's just fair that he would take it back with him. In fact, we learned last, well, two weeks ago in Genesis chapter 12, that it was at the hand of um, Pharaoh uh, because he, was, he cared about Sarai and what had happened. He gave these gifts to Abram to take back with him. So he was the, the method that God had used, the means that God had used to produce this wealth in Abram. And that says that he had here that he was given sheep and oxen, male donkeys, male servants, if you remember that, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. The female donkeys were a transportation for the rich, and camels were a prestigious symbol of the super rich. And we'll see that here in just a few moments as to how that would be panned out in um, his choices that he makes with Lot. But it's sufficient to say that we'll see that though Abram was rich, very well off, he was still a humble man. He still preferred others over himself. He did not allow his kingship over his country, his area, his domain that God is giving him and had given him to allow him to have that place of, of great authority to where other people were of no concern in his life. He was still a humble man. His wealth had not provided a reason for great pride. It's not true for many today, though, is it? Oftentimes we get great wealth. We, it comes with it as great pride. Um, look what I have, so therefore I don't need. Look what I have, therefore you don't, you don't have, and you can't have. We have to be careful because pride is a, before pride, um, that grows a great fall. So the word severe here, uh, heavy, it was used also back to describe the famine in chapter 12. It said the famine was severe. The word there was heavy. And he's using the same word Moses does here for the word that is describing Abram's current possession, his wealth and his great number of possessions. That it was, he was very rich, the same word there, heavy. So God is showing through Moses that the blessings that he had recovered exceeded any previous status that he had in life before the famine experience that he had. And she remind us that we serve a mighty God. A mighty God do we serve. He's gracious to serve us and to give us these, these great things, these kind things. We don't deserve anything, but he gives them to us out of his love. Abram's exodus and return to Canaan not only may be a picture of the prodigal son that I mentioned a few moments ago and God's graciousness and providing a place for him to return to and not just giving up on him, but also as a foreshadowing of the Israelites and their great departure when they were in Egypt for a period of time and captive to the, to the Pharaohs and to the, the time that they were there for those many years. But God was still at work. Just reminds us that even, again, even when we are in Egypt, God is still working for and on our behalf, for our good. That's where we were before Christ. Before we knew Christ and his salvation, we were wandering in Egypt. We were walking dead men and dead women. But God used it, used the things of this world to draw our attention to the greater being of who he is. Well, verses 3 and 4, And he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at the first, and there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. So when he left Egypt, he's journeying now back to something that he's familiar with. He's familiar with. And, and honestly, when you and I have had a time in Egypt, and we're, we're Christians, but we had a, a time in Egypt, don't you want to get back to that which you're comfortable with? Don't you want to return back to that which you knew as being true? You want to turn to the Word of God. You want to get on your knees and repent of your sin. You want to return to that which is right a place where he knew, last knew God's presence and worship. And that's what you and I should do as well. We want to go back to the familiar place where we can worship once again. I hope this serves as a reminder that you and I, when we sin against God, 
as a redeemed child, not as an unforgiving or unrepentant sinner, but as a redeemed child. That should be our desire. Don't linger in Egypt. Find your way out of there by God's grace and return to the familiar place where you worshiped, where you once worshiped him with all of your being. And call upon the name of the Lord. Ask him to forgive. Ask him to restore. Tell him you repent. You're sorry for your time in Egypt. So it goes back to Bethel, the house of God, the land where he had made an altar to the Lord. And there again, it says he called upon the Lord. I couldn't help but wonder when I read that, I wondered what that sounded like. This great man of God with all these many possessions and grace that he was shown while he was in a foreign country, a foreign land with his sparing Sarai and so forth. I wonder what it sounded like when he called upon the Lord. Maybe in the privacy of just himself on this altar. Surely there was much gratitude because he had gained so many possessions. God had blessed him in so many ways. So I'm sure he had a grateful heart. Surely he had moved in worship as he pondered the sin that he had experienced and saw there in that other land in light of God's grace. As he saw his, his even as he spoke the words and lie about Sarai before Pharaoh and his men. Kind of like the, the rooster crowing. You, 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 you'll reject me three times. Your mind goes immediately back. Surely he was gracious by God's, and graced by God's light to show him how much he had moved from. And I'm sure he was worshiping God. How God had kept Sarai in the house of Pharaoh, even amidst his lie. How the sovereign Lord had worked to keep him from worshiping other gods. There's no in indication here that he did that. There was no concern when, in the beginning when he was called out of Her Her of the Chaldeans. God made it clear that there was other gods there present and probably was the worship of the season for the families that are there. There's no indication. Moses did not say that while in Egypt he worshiped the gods. But neither does it say that he worshiped the God. There's no evidence that there was an altar made by Abram there. So I would imagine once he left, he was eager to get back to, to the altar and worship his God once again. God had stirred Pharaoh to act, and he moved him back to that which he was familiar with. Oh, he was a recipient of God's grace. Does that move your heart this morning? That you sit here, and you're a recipient of God's grace. Does that move you? Does that stir your heart in gratitude? How much he has done for you. Not to mention, just beyond salvation, just everyday grace. Aren't you grateful? By all account, Abram should have been thrown out on his ear. I mean, Pharaoh could have said, let me have everything you brought into the country with you. Forget it. You get out of here. Strip your bear and just you go back to your own land. But he didn't. God had pro provided for him and protected him. And as you and I are, are held captive by the grace of God in our lives, my friends, worship should be our response. I think all too often that word worship is foreign to us. We, we narrow down the idea of worship of that 15 minutes that we sing on Sunday morning or the five or seven minutes that we spend before a table of communion. But my friends, our lives should be lives of worship. All that we are, all that we have should be a worship to God, a testimony of his grace to us. We too should have been thrown out on our ears. How many times have we rebelled against God? How many times have we told him, no, well, I'm going to do it my own way. And yet God's love is consistent. And he draws us back to himself. He's so gracious to us. Focus on his grace, people of God. And it will give your life more joy. It will give your life more of a fulfillment. And you have a greater love and compassion for those who don't know the grace that you know in Christ. And that grace should lead you to worship with thanksgiving and, and, and an attitude of praise toward God. Verses five and six. 
And Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. Gives us the picture of prosperity, does it not, for both Abram and Lot to the place that they have to do something about this. But now it says that they're back in Canaan, but, he, but Moses makes it very clear that the Canaanites and the Perizzites are still there. So they're still occupying the land, so therefore they're taking up some space. Um, and so there's a problem. The space that they do have right now, Lot and Abram and their herdsmen are starting to argue and they're clashing heads. There's not enough space for us to feed our animals and take care of our animals. And, and Abram's smart, he's wise. He sees that the wealth that they've accumulated is truly a blessing, but at the same time, he sees the elements of strife breaking out among the herdsmen. And if he's not careful, it will filter over into the lives of Lot and Abram as well. There's a spread potential for the strife. When you and I are involved in strife, our desire should be to remedy that strife to find a way out, use wisdom to come away from that. It should not break apart and tear apart. And God gives Abram wisdom. And he, he makes a dis- determination. We have to remember too that you know, the word tells us that their love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So this could have been a place that Abram could have said, you know what, I'm, I'm older than you are. I'm, I'm the king of this land. God has given it to me. And therefore, I'm gonna make the choices. And you get the leftovers. But that's not what happens. Abram sees that there needs to be an intervention here. There needs to be an element of peace interjected here. Are you a man or a woman of peace? Are you one that people will call to help bring peace to two that are in argument or fighting or there's strife breaking out and or, or do you run from that? They were in the Canaan land, but yet they were still around those Canaanites and Perizzites that were worshiping other gods. It could have influenced them, but Abram stood strong. And he knew that for those who endeavored to live lives of peace, they must be free of strife. Romans twelve eighteen says, if possible, so far as depends on you, live peaceably with all. You can't be responsible for how other people respond or act, but you can surely be responsible for how you respond and act. It was Abram that pointed out this obvious concern. Do you have friends? Do you have loved ones who would love you enough to come to you and point out an area of strife or area of contention or area area of sin in your life that needs to be dealt with? Or are we so standoffish, it'll, it'll just pan out in the end, it'll work out okay. Abram took the bull by the horn, and he is the elder, stands the reason he, could have, he should be the one to notice the condition first, and he does, he does something about it. And this answer he gives, it conforms by wisdom to separate. There's the answer, so we'd have, this is the land we have, X amount of acreage, We've got this amount of possessions. I've got this amount of possessions. We just need to separate. Perfect answer. He could have also, um, again, ruled and reigned, but he didn't, as we saw before, because we talked about the female donkeys and the, the camels. It placed him in a place of, of um, it gave him a place of authority. He could have chosen him for himself, but he didn't. Though a man of royalty, so to speak, He had the right to make his own decisions first, but he doesn't do that. He is humbled. As a king, he doesn't choose first. Rather, he typifies our Lord Jesus Christ, who, though king of all, would ride into Jerusalem on a female donkey. Though Lord of all would choose to remove his outer garment at one point in time and and put a towel around his waist and wash his disciples' feet. Well, king of glory willingly lay down his life on the cross of Calvary, not for his own sin, but for ours, those of us who are all unworthy in ourselves. 
as our Lord recorded through the Apostle Paul in Philippians 2, which we've recently studied on Tuesday and Thursday nights, that each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Had this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus said in Luke 22, a dispute arose among them, among the men there, and as they as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but, but not so you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. For he who is the greatest or the greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves, which one is it? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you, I am among you, so as you would be one who would serve. I think we see that in Abram, that we had everything. He put his own will and, and plans in, on hold for that of Lot. We learn in Solomon's wisdom in Proverbs 17, and I think we see that truth that would be scribed later, even here, in Genesis chapter 13, where the author of Proverbs 17 says, the beginning of strife is like letting out water, so quit before the quarrel breaks out. Catch it before it gets too far along. Romans 12, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Philippians 2, 4, last one. When we hold close to God's sovereign hand in all our ways, we will not be so eager to grasp for things best left alone. Alexander McLaren stated, the less our energies are consumed as in asserting ourselves and scrambling for our rights and cutting in before other people, so as to get the best places for ourselves, the more we shall have to spare for better things and the more we live in the future and leave God to order our ways, the more shall our souls be in perfect peace. Trust in God. Abraham is learning to trust God. His faith is growing. Lots is focused. His eyes are on that which is most glorious. In verse 10, and Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. This is what he saw with his own eyes. Does that remind you of anyone else in the, maybe in the Garden of Eden in the beginning? Behold, the fruit is good for the eyes. And he saw the lushness of the Jordan Valley as he stood some 3,000 feet above that which he looked upon near in the direction of Zoar. And this beautiful picture, this wonderful watered scenery, it drew his heart to his demise. Not literally, because God spared his life. But we see his beginning of a downward spiral as it drew his eyes there, he would say, my eyes must be satisfied. That's what I want. So what are your eyes focused on this morning? What Do you choose the well-watered Egypts or the faith-filled deserts that God would call you to perhaps? Fame, wealth, prestige, or humility? honoring to the Lord Jesus Christ and all that you are and do? Is it drawn to faith and God's provision for your life or to have an ability within yourself to make choices to do what's best for you? At least you think you do. We need to constantly keep our eyes on Christ, on the heavenly truths and riches that we have in the word of God because you and I, we're at that place and our being that we too can gather from this world the sufficiency and the pleasure that it offers and be drawn to it with our eyes. The battle is constantly raging. We must keep our eyes 
on Christ. So Lot chose, it says, for himself in verse 11. And this brought two separations, one that was physical, a distance between him and Abram and his family, and then one of a spiritual condition. We see him starting to decline. Moses had warned us here that there were um, those in the land of Sodom, the area wherein he was drawn to. The men were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. Even if he's unaware of that truth at this point in time, you know that once he lived there, he would see the evidence of their sin, how blatant it would be. They weren't ashamed of it. And he would have choice to leave. But he doesn't. The well-watered land, that which is like the Garden of Eden, the Garden of God or Egypt was too satisfying. The things of this world were too captivating. It's tragic, is it not, when we choose seeing the things of this world and being drawn to them rather than feeling and knowing rest in the faith of God and his great provision for us? How tragic when once we learn of our sin, we hesitate to repent and we linger in it too long. We choose evil over, godless, over godliness. But Lot doesn't stay with Abraham in that sense or choose a better place. He goes. And he's, I know he's not thinking about it. I would think, is this where I want to raise my family? Especially once he got down there and saw what was going on. Is this, is this how I want them to be brought up? Is the school district good enough for me to raise my children in? Can I worship God freely in this surrounding condition that I find myself living in? Now, rather, he pitched his tent right there near Sodom. One commentary put his decision this way. He resembles those who would gladly choose heaven over hell, but not necessarily heaven over earth. And there's a big difference. Trusting the Lord will lead to paths of righteousness and provision but not when our earthly eyes are leading the way. Lot, who would become the father of the Moabites and the Ammonites, who were enemies, according to Judges 10, would serve other gods. And we can see perhaps the, the beginning of this here. Sad trajectory for this Lot and his family. It's a sad trajectory for anyone who would choose Egypt over Canaan. But God's grace, once again, comes into display and Abram in verses 14 through 17 we won't read it again but God involves himself in, in, in Lot's I mean Abram's presence and he shares with him all the things that was going to happen lift up your eyes and look see Lot lifted up his eyes and what he saw drew his flesh and God the father is saying Abram not so with you you look lift up your eyes and see how much I'm giving you my I will provide this for you. It's what he says. I will lift up. I will be lifted up. I will give to you. I will, I will, I will. Not you will choose. On what you see, look at what I will provide for you. Not chose to lift his eyes as Eve had with the garden in the Garden of Eden. Abram waits on the Lord as he ponders perhaps in his altar worship experiences. And God reminds him of his sovereignty and his working and provision. I will. And he says, Abram, cast your eyes everywhere and then walk it north and south and east and west and, and feel and experience my covenant that I'm making with you. It's not earned. Moses, you don't deserve this. Look what you just came out of. But I, as your gracious God, will provide it for you. Experience the promise by walking throughout the land. <coughs> I will truly give it to you. You know, one day our faith will be made sight. Is it not true? One day as we sang about, the Lord will be coming back and all that we've thought about, all the, the understanding and excitement, which I hope it does bring you excitement when you think about the Lord's return, that it could be today or tomorrow, it will be made sight. And I believe it would be overwhelming if it were not for the presence and the power of the Spirit of God in our lives to change us. I will give it, he says. Undeserving in his own right, we see here the final so in chapter 13, verse 18. So Abram moved his tent 
and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron. And what did he do? And there he built an altar to the Lord. Worship back in, or book ends, chapter 13. He came out of, of Egypt into Canaan, and he worships. And he makes these decisions, and God shows himself once again of, of his power and his covenant. And he worships. I don't think you and I have a good taste yet of worship. I'm not talking about necessarily raising your hands or shouting loud or, or anything else that might be an outward expression of worship, but I just wonder in our heart of hearts what worship looks like, what it feels like. While in Egypt, it appears that Abram's greatest concern was for himself. But when he's back in the promised land, it shifts. And now he's preferring his nephew over himself. And he's trusting the fulfillment of God's sovereign work. And he's being obedient to God's command and his words. We've been given the opportunity to make choices as well. And I pray that you and I might learn from Abram and Lot's experiences and choices in their journey. Mainly not to base our decisions on what we see, not even necessarily what we feel, but on God's word. And you find yourself wandering off into Egypt and it doesn't have to be a, be a full-blown vacation in Egypt. It could be just a temptation to want to go there. Quickly build an altar of worship. Go to his word. Let it bathe your heart and your mind that you can withstand the pressures. <coughs> excuse me, to be drawn into Egypt. Seek first his kingdom, <coughs> the word of God says, and all the other things, all the peripheral things will be added to you. Worship. Let's pray. <coughs> excuse me, Father, you are worthy of worship. I love that song. Worthy of worship, worthy of praise. Father, nothing we offer can come close to what your worthiness portrays well we stammer we're weak we try our best we make choices that sometimes are not the right ones but you remain faithful and Lord I don't know exactly what it means to fully worship you with all of our heart mind soul and strength to love you that that dearly I have an understanding in my mind I don't think I've I've done it for a moment much less for a day or a week or a month and this idea of worship Lord I we'll have an eternity we'll be spent worshiping you show us a glimpse give us a glimpse of how we can demonstrate that in our daily walk here in this world help us to spend less time in Egypt and more time in Canaan where we worship you with all of our being. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen.